one of the uh, objectives of uh, Cauldron is to act as a tutorial venue for developers. So not user tutorials, developer tutorials. Um, and a, long, a very long-standing personal interest of mine is simulation, how you model the real world. Um, going right back to when I used to use computer algebra to model enzyme kinetic systems. Um, but I've had a long-standing interest in how you model um, computer architecture at all levels. Um, hence my long-standing interest in CGen, uh, which I've used on and off for at least a decade. And I thought it's one of those tools that is very useful, but not that widely known. So I, took the opp I take the opportunity just to take you through some of the key features of CGen at a practical level. And I hope the slides I prepare will act as a bit of a useful aid memoir for anyone who's doing this in the future. Um, so what is CGen? Uh, written by Doug Evans. I don't think I've actually ever met Doug, but he's... Um, the, I think, believe it was his MSc project. And the idea is to take a description of an ISA captured in Scheme, dialect of LISC, and that to capture both the syntax of the instruction set and the semantics of the instruction set, and then use that information to generate an assembler and a disassembler, um, effectively automatically generating lib op codes, and to be able to generate a simulator so that would be libsim, and you know, to be able to generate other things like documentation of the instruction set and even a test framework uh, for an instruction set. So I'm going to look at this using RISC-V as an example. That's partly because we've commercially been doing a lot of work on implementing the entire RISC-V instruction set, all its different variant extension instruction sets in CGen, um, and I'll talk more about that right at the end while we're doing that. So CGen's quite old. First release was in July 2000. The second release was in October 2009. And it's regarded as a pretty stable piece of software. Um, currently, there are about 30 different CPU descriptions up the, up, upstream. Um, so where it fits in, so here's your typical simplified tool chain, you put C or C++ code into GCC, it gives you assembler, which you put into the GNU assembler, and it spits out object code. And where CGen can help you is in generating gas, in generating a disassembler as the inverse, which can go into object dump for the minus D option, and in generating a simulator. And in all cases, these are table-driven um, solutions. So let's start off by looking at how the architecture is described in Scheme. Um, so scheme, the, scheme, CGen, the CGen scheme description takes two views. It, it has a hardware view of the world. It says, I've got an architecture, RISC-V in that case. And within those architectures, I may have a number of families. So in RISC-V, we've got a 64-bit family, and we've got a 32-bit family. And one day, we may have a 128-bit family. And then within those, you have a number of machines, which are starting to specialize down a bit. And they correspond pretty much to the BFD concept of a Mac. And then within those, you have particular models. And that's not model in the sense of simulation. It's model in the sense of manufacturer's ID on there. So this is, this is the one, this is the version of this machine made by this customer with this particular pipeline and so forth. So that's the hardware view of the world. And then we have a software view of the world which says, oh, we have instruction sets, or instruction set architectures. And they're made up of collections of instructions, and instructions are made of operands, and operands correspond to fields within the instruction. So let's look at those. So let's look at how you describe, we'll just look at the syntax for now, what you need for the assembler and disassembler. Um, so that goes into the CPU directory within your bin utils tree. Okay. And within there, we'll have a .cpu file, which is the scheme description, and an .opc file, which is support C code, because it becomes clear that some of the stuff is just too hard to do in scheme, and the ability to call out to C is a good idea. And you'll use that to generate source files for the um, assembler and disassembler, that'll be for libopcodes in the opcodes directory. And for a simulator, it'll be in the target architectures 
subset directory of the simulation directory. Um, <clears throat> and it, it generates source files, and typically those source files are committed to the source tree. So someone downloading your system doesn't have to be able to run CGen to regenerate the tool. Um, so what about some general con concepts um, within CGen? Your CGen description starts with an include uh, call just to include basically all the CGen code. Um, and it has some general things that we'll see throughout. Attributes, which specify properties of things I'm defining. Modes, which like GCC are what the rest of the world calls types. And it even uses the same notation as GCC. So quarter integers, half integers, single integers, double integers. And it does expressions as GCC RTL. The syntax is almost identical. There's a subtle structural difference to the way you represent modes in the in expressions. And amongst the predefined functions is one called C call, which is call out to C to do something. So at the top level, first thing you do is define the architecture. You have define arch as a, uh, a scheme function, and it follows the same as all the other scheme things, a set of arguments which are themselves function calls. So you can define a name for this entity, risk five in our case, a comment about it, I've just put risk five, it could be a bit more general than that. Something you do right at the top is agree your convention for how you number bits in a word. And is the least significant bit zero, or is that the most significant bit? So in the case of risk five, the, this is not about endianness, it's just about how you number your bits in a word. The least significant bit is the zero bit, it, it, it is numbered zero. And then you list Strangely enough, not what CPU families, but what machines, the next level down on the hierarchy, are within this architecture. And the reason for that is that machines are actually the point in the hardware view where you synchronize with the software view, which is the instruction set architecture. And machines are typically named in the form of um, architecture, colon, Mac field um, in, the BS, in BFD. And then you also list the instruction set architectures that can be associated with this architecture. So that's the top level of the hardware view. And then the top level of the software view is we define an instruction set architecture. And that has a name and comment. You'll see everything has a name and a comment. And then we say a few things about the ISA, like what's the size of a word in this ISA? What's the... Um, uh, so, so instruction word, if you have multi-word instructions, so the actual instruction bit size and then the, number, the size of the words within the instructions, which for risk 5 are the same, they're 32 bits, and at the baseline instruction bit size. What becomes clear as you go through CGen is there is a bit of redundancy where you say the same thing twice in places. I think that probably starts to set a bit of a picture about this is a tool that needs a bit of love. Um, and then the next level down on the uh, uh, hardware hierarchy uh, from the architecture, we'll go back into the hardware world. We've defined the top of the hardware world and the top of the software world in the ISA. Let's go back to the hardware hierarchy. And define CPU is actually should really be called define CPU family. It's about a family of CPUs. And for risk 5 we'll have all the 64-bit in one family and 32-bit in another. Okay? And you say, okay, what's the... Um, Endianness of this architecture, it's little endian, and what is the uh, bit size of a word? And it's a 64 bit architecture, so it's fundamentally 64 bit. And say, I'm, I'm going to focus on this one family today, but you can have multiple families in your definition. And now you define the MAC, and that corresponds to a BFD. So where you have a unique BFD, then you have a unique MAC. And for us, we're only going to worry about one, which is the generic RISC-V CPU. And the, the, um, so we say, which CPU family does it belong to? RISC-V, 64BF. There is a convention in CPU families. You, you suffix them all with BF for base family. It doesn't really mean anything beyond the fact that there is a glitch in CGEM where you get name clashes. So you want CPU families not to have names that are used anywhere else. And the important thing when you have a Mac 
is that's the point at which you truly associate with ISAs. So there you list the instruction set architectures that will run on this machine. Now, I've put down RV64i, the baseline RISC-V instruction set, but I could have lots on there. I could say it can also run the floating point instruction, RV64F and RV64D, and the multiplier, RV64M, and so forth. So, and then within there, we have models. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm only going to look at one model. Now, that, as I say, is model in the sense of manufacturer, but it corresponds to, at the simulator level, the thing you're going to simulate. Um, and here, a name and a comment as useful, usual, the machine that this model belongs to, so in the hierarchy. And then we have to define an execution unit, and this is a bit odd because you do have to put this here, even though at this stage I'm only looking at syntax. I'm not actually building the simulator, but it should be possible actually to leave that out. Again, another bit of polish needed in CGen. So that's a dummy one that just says, here is a, an execution unit in its minimal state. It's not needed at this stage. Um, and then we get to the low level of the hardware, and this is where it's interesting. And in the low level hardware, you can define things like registers, memory, and actually constants. Oh, they're regarded as hardware entities. So here's how I define the, the, the program counter. By convention, hardware elements begin H, so H hyphen PC, the program counter, and I tell it, it's got attributes. Now, attributes are properties. Program counters are known about, they're special, so I can give it the predefined property PC, program counter, I can also give it a list of ISAs that use this. Well, we've only got one in this example, RV64i. And I can give it a list of machines that use this. Again, we've only got one machine here. And I then give it a type, which is which mode is it? And it turns out PC is a special predefined type for program counters. And you can have banks of registers, and all that happens is that I have to add an index. So I say type register. I can give it a mode and say these have a particular type, which is Double, uh, uh, double integer, and I'll have 32 of them. So I've got 32 64-bit registers, but then I'm going to have to name those registers, and so I have another argument to say what the indices are, and there are a series of pairs, name of the register, and the index it corresponds to. And there you see I've named all 32 general purpose registers, but the interesting thing is I can have more than one name. Those are the ABI names for the RISC-V registers, but they also have raw names, X0 to X31, and I can add those in there. So for each register, it's got two names, and I can use either when assembling. When I disassemble, I'll end up using the first named, which means I'll end up using the ABI names when I disassemble. And there are some predefined hardware elements. H memory, which is a simple bank of memory, so you don't have to worry about defining memory if you've just got a simple general memory, which is fine for RISC-V. Signed and unsigned integers are a thing for representing a data address and a thing for representing um, an instruction address. So now let's start looking at the software side. So to build up the instructions that make up an ISA, we need to talk about, the, initially, the syntax of an instruction. And we start at the lowest level with an instruction field. Okay. And an instruction field is just saying where my bits start and how many bits are. So the opcode field for this basic instruction starts at bit 6 and has, comprises 7 bits. And by convention, fields begin with F hyphen as their name. And I can make them a bit more complex. So here is an immediate. I've given it a mode to say, yes, okay, this is a 12-bit field, but I want you to convert it to a double uh, integer. Okay. Um, and so that's straightforward enough. Now, you can also have fields. We all know of architectures where a constant is split over several fields within the instruction. So you can have multi-fields. Multi and you do those by defining, defining a whole set of instruction fields. And then you describe a field that's made up of other fields uh, to, to make that. I'm not going to go into that here. It's not needed here. So, um, it turns out, while fields are just physically describing where things are, it's quite useful to add a layer of abstraction above this. 
Um, and in particular, to sort of generalize the fact, not that this field has particular values, but there's a concept of a field that handles something. So an operand sits above a field. Um, and for things like a register, I want to say this field is a register, and it gives me a variable that holds the value that's got in that field. So here I've defined RD, uh, the destination register, and it's based on the RD field, which is a particular 5-bit field. Um, and that 5-bit field was found in the HGD, oh, so I relate it to a piece of hardware. I defined the hardware registers with a particular, um, uh, um, uh, so I've got that relationship there. Um, and I can define constants the same. So my immediate 12-bit field, I need to, I can define it as an operand expanded to 32 bits. And I can use that then to put together my instructions. And this is what an instruction is. I've got, it's got a name, it's got a description, it belongs to an ISA. And it could belong to multiple ISAs, but it belongs to a particular instruction set. And it has a syntax. Now the syntax is quite loose. It's not trying to say the precise format of how this must look in the assembly code. It's really just saying, here's where the mnemonic is, here's a space, which could be any sort of space, and here are the arguments or the operands, and the operands are separated, and the commas tell you which the different operands are. And the operands must be things you've done with define operand. They can't be things you've done with define field. So this says an add I instruction consists of the mnemonic add I, followed by a destination register, and then a first source register, and then a 12-bit immediate field. So that's the syntax of the assembler. And then format tells you how it physically is laid out in the instruction. Okay. And the plus there, it's one of those things. The, the way CGEM was designed with, I think, some broader concepts, but the only thing is plus. So it just has to have a plus there. It's one of the rules. And then you give it the list of fields. So this is made up of an immediate 12-bit, a source register, operand. The actual function field, um, which is a sub field of the opcode, I can just do directly as a field. I haven't named it or made it an operand or anything. Then the destination register, and then the opcode field with a particular fixed value. Okay? So that adds the add immediate instruction, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm only going to look at how we create an assembler that can just assemble an add immediate instruction. Okay? So that actually has defined a full CPU. It's only got one instruction, it's only got one instruction family but it's enough to build the bits. So alongside, we've got that support code. And of the various files generated, a number of them need support code. And that's where you've added, you've done expressions that involve the C call to call out C code. And there are four of them. They're surrounded by special comments. For a minimal assembler, you hardly need anything. You do seem to need one thing, which is the disassembler has a hash table to help it speed up how it disassembles. The documentation says you should be able to leave it out. My practical experience is it doesn't work if you do that. Um, so this is just the, um, in the header file, I set some constants to define a minimum, uh, a hash table with a single entry. Uh, and then it'll chain or everything off that single entry. Um, but that's where, if you had lots of C code calling out, you'd put it in this file. So I've defined an architecture, and I've defined its support code for what it's worth for a single instruction. Let's now look at turning that into an assembler and disassembler. First of all, installing CGen. Um, well, you can do this, obviously, with anyone, but I'm going to look at doing it with top of tree. Okay? So clone bin utils GDP, which is in repository. That's all lovely and easy. CGen is still in CVS, so you'll need to check out top of tree. And then you merge CGen into binutils GDB. And you do that by copying the top level CGen directory from the CGen repository into the top level of binutils GDB. You exclude the CPU subdirectory. Okay? And you also exclude the CVS directory, because you don't want that in here. And then there is another CPU directory at the top level of CGen, and that's the one you want. I think the one in, if someone can clarify, my understanding is the one inside CGen is a bit of a legacy, and it's never gone away. 
So that gives you two extra top-level directories in binutils GDB. And that's all you need to do to install CGen. Though there is a stable 1.1 release, it is nine years old, and things have moved on, and people have patched CGen to deal with different hierarchies to include files and so forth. So if you're going to work with top, top of tree binutils GDB, you really need to work with top of tree CGen. Um, you can just about get to use the stable version for the syntax stuff. The semantic stuff just breaks. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that when you use this, CGen's quite old. It doesn't work with Guile 2. You've got to use Guile 1.8 or 1.6. So that's it. We've installed it. Now, how do we configure so that when we build stuff, we pick up all the CGen stuff? Well, in the opcodes directory, you need to tell it the binaries. And those binaries come from a set of files generated by CGen. And those files are uh, RISC-5, ASM.C, DESK.C, DIST.C, and so forth. I'll talk about those a bit later. The, the, I've got a slide about that in a minute. Um, and in the makefile.am, you need to tell it about its source files, its headers, its source files. You'll find a section where it talks about CGen maint. And this is to do with causing the files to be regenerated, and that needs you to configure with minus enable cgen maint. And this tells you, if you're doing that, use this, and we use a timestamp file to make sure we were up to date, stamp risk five. And then we need to add rules to generate those, okay? So you've got a dependency on all the source files that are generated, which depends on the, uh, the risk five dependency we defined earlier. And then that timestamp controls whether you regenerate based on the uh, date of the CPU and OPC files. And within the standard make file, there is a run CGen uh, target, which actually will then fire up scheme, give it all the right arguments to bring in all the right CGen stuff. And it takes a number of parameters to tell it what the architecture is, what the prefixes you want on the files. So we're going to be risk v hyphen something. Where to find your architecture file, where to find your OPC file. And of course, because you've changed config and so forth, you need to regenerate it. Um, if you're working on top of tree, those are the versions of autoconf and automake that will work without regenerating stuff slightly differently um, that's already there. Um, so that's done the configuration. Um, what else do we need to change? Um, well, you need to make sure in the disassemble.c that you've actually got something that knows about your architecture. CGen won't magically put this stuff in there for you. Uh, I fundamentally, a disassembler needs to print an instruction function. That will be generated by CGen, but you need to tell the disassemble code about it. And um, you need to tell the header about that file as well, that, that function, uh, that, that, that there is an external one generated by CGen. So now we've configured it. Let's build it. So out of tree build, uh, so we make a build directory, we configure, we specify our target. We need to turn off where because there's stuff that will break modern C compilers. And minus enable cgen mate. In other words, regenerate the cgen files if you need to. And we have make all build, that builds the infrastructure. Make all opcodes, that will rebuild lib opcodes. Um, if we just then go and say make bin utils, it will try and make the GNU assembler. And I haven't yet talked about how we set that up. I just want to build objdump. So we configure bin utils, so we get a bin utils build directory, go into that directory and build that. And that will build us objdump and all the other low level bin utils. Here's a little demo program. It has one instruction we know about, which is add immediate, and one instruction we don't know, which is add registers. And we're going to cheat because we've already got a RISC-V toolchain which already does this. So let's make ourselves a binary. Uh, so with the, um, by using the existing assembler to, to create a binary. So we can see if the disassembler works. And then we can give it the disassembler. So there's the object dump I've created with um, my CGen. There's my example binary. And when I disassemble, it recognizes add i because I've defined that in CGen. It doesn't recognize the add instruction, so it just says, well, I don't know what it is. Okay? So that's all there is to creating a disassembler. To make a full disassembler, I just need to add the rest of the instructions in. Okay? So 
it's a mechanical exercise, and later on I'll go into how we make that faster. If we want to create a GNU assembler, CGen is only providing the engine. It's not doing the other stuff. So if you want to write a, a, a GNU assembler, there's a load of functions you have to apply. Some of them can be done as macros instead. Whether you do it by hand or by CGen, um, uh, you have to define these. There's only one of them specific to CGen, which is MD CGen Lookup Relog, um, which is, if you've enabled CGen for your assembler, will cause that to be needed. Um, and there's some global variables you have to set. Okay. Now, the global variables, there's nothing CGen specific about those. Those are the same as if you're handwriting assembler. This is not a tutorial on how to write an assembler. Um, you need to put some added headers in, okay, into your... Um, into your configuration files um, and to pick up the description uh, files from generated by CGen. So those first two are generated by CGen and there's a CGen header as part of GAS and that's the one in the GAS directory, not in the opcodes directory and the search path will pick up the correct one automatically. And then some of those standard assembly functions, there are CGen helpers. So MD apply fix to apply fix ups to your assembly. There's a CGen do that for you, generated automatically. The MD assemble, which is at the heart of the assembler, this is to assemble a single instruction. Okay, there are this is a standard structure for a CGen based assemble. You can then extend it. You have to find, define yourself a buffer. CGen can be particularly efficient if it believes you can fit an instruction into an integer. Otherwise, it uses a char buffer. Um, and then you initialize your pars. You assemble your instruction, um, and assuming the assembler goes right, then you can finish off by pushing it out. Okay. MD begin is the initializer, and that's where you set the global variable gas CGen CPU desk, which was picked up by the assembly function. So there's a CGen thing to open and initialize the assembler. Okay. And for um, converting Relox from internal format to BFD format, GAS gives you a standard way of, a CGen gives you a standard way of doing that. And the standard way of handling operands, and that's it. So everything else to do with the assembler is the same as if you were handwriting assembler, but some of the hard stuff has been taken away. In particular, the whole thing, MD assemble, which is the hard stuff, has been taken away from you. To configure, um, you just need to set using CGen equals yes in configure.ac. That's all you need to do. Obviously, regenerate it. Um, and then you can just make the, the GNU assembler. And now we can actually use our own assembler. So there's our t a simple test program with add immediate in it, x1, x2, 42. We assemble it with the new assembler. And then we give it back to the disassembler. And one thing I should have pointed out before, you'll notice my test program uses the raw register names. But when I disassemble, as expected, by preference, I use the ABI names for the registers, and that's because of the ordering I had in the description. And it does do errors, so let's give it a piece of assembler with an instruction I don't know about, and then when I try and run it, it baffs and say, I don't know about this instruction. So that, that is how you create a disassembler and assembler, the syntax side of it. What I'm going to quickly look at now um, is how you do a simulator. This is harder, okay, in the sense that for the assembler and disassembler, pretty much CGen does everything of any significance. For the simulator, you still have to do quite a lot, particularly when you want to simulate more than just one instruction set architecture on one machine or one CPU family. So, let's look at how we create it. We need to add semantic information to RISC-V.CPU, um, and that will be used to generate target-specific files um, in the... Uh, it generates one more opcodes file, the opints.c file, which carries the semantic information in libopcodes. But it also generates a whole load of files in the um, target-specific simulator directory, okay? as well as some generic CGen files that CGen generates, but they're not target-specific. Um, and it also will use a script to generate a main loop automatically from you from a, an input file and some configure well config.h is standard for autoconf and eng.h is the header that goes with the main loop the engine. so we put semantic information into hardware 
So for registers, we give it an expression to uh, read um, the value from a piece of hardware and to write it. Raw reg is a bit of a special function. Um, it's, it, requires to, it requires a corresponding function written in C to actually access and set the state um, there. Um, and there's a, if you have a register bank like the GPRs, you just need to pass an index in. Okay, so that's the semantics on the hardware. And then for the instruction, we need to set the semantics of all that semantic information to be passed up into fields and operands and so forth. Um, we need to set the semantics for the instruction. So for the semantics for the instruction, are saying the way I um, do an add immediate is I take the 64-bit value from the RS from the RS1 register and the immediate 12-bit immediate value, and I add those together and I set that as a 64-bit value into the RD register. So that's the semantic, very simply, the semantic information for our instruction. The semantics can get complicated, and there is the call out to C code, and for really complicated things, invariably, that's what you need to do. Then we need to give it some handwritten files to pull this all together. So RISC-V.C is, it really ought to be RISC-V-CPUFamily.C, actually, because it gives you CPU family-specific stuff. It includes some standard headers and your generated decoder header. And it defines these lowest level fetch and set a register. So fetch a register, my registers are numbered 0 to 31 for the general registers and 32 for the PC. Um, and I can use the generated macros to actually access the representation of those, the state of those within the model um, to, to get them. Um, and obviously, it shouldn't ever give me bad values there. Um, and then I need to do a store register function. And the only thing to note here is that if the register of that register zero in risk five, you can write to and it won't do anything. It's permanently held at zero. And here, if, if register is zero, we just don't do anything. Um, simif.c, now, when you write a simulator, fundamentally, if you do it by hand, you have to write a series of sim functions, sim open, sim close, and so forth. Quite a few of those are automatically generated for you by the CGen infrastructure, but a number of them you have to write yourself, even though they tend to sit on a fairly standard structure. Um, <clears throat> one thing is when you things go wrong with the simulator, you want to free up your memory. The standard simulator free of state doesn't free all the CGen state. So we've done our own little RISC-V free state, which free, frees up some CGen specific stuff and then calls sim state free, which is the generic free up state. Um, we have to write our own sim open. Okay? Now, this has a fairly standard structure. None of this here is any different to what you'd write on a hand-driven assembler. And there's a set, set of things you need to do to allocate a CPU, process arguments, and so forth. None of this is CGen specific. But then we get to the core of it, where we get a CPU description, which we use the CGen open function. Okay? We go through uh, the processors we have um, and set up properties to do with those processors in the CPU state. And we initialize the disassembler. Um, and then we initialize uh, CGen init, which is the initializer of the simulator side, and we return the description. So there's CGen specific functions, and that's a pretty standard format. You copy it from someone else's CGen description and reuse it. And we also have to write sim create inferior. Now, I don't quite understand why that's not automatically generated, because fundamentally there's nothing CGen specific about it. Okay? Um, and we need to write sim set PC, um, sorry, sim create, sim cre this is the rest of sim create inferior, and so it sets the PC and so forth, but none of this is CGen specific. And we need to provide handling of some insections, exceptions, the only one that matters is the invalid instruction, and that goes in traps.c, it should be traps-cpufamily.c really, because if you, you'll need multiple ones of these different CPU families, and it's worth noting how you've got that define the CPU family associated with that here. And that, um, uh, that does nothing in our case, but we do have to provide it. Um, and 
then there's a header file to go with our riskv.c, uh, but there's nothing in there for us. And then the other thing that's expected is simmain.h, which basically pulls together all the standard headers, the cgen headers, and your target generated headers. Um, and that will be included by an awful lot of the standard code. Um, we do have to define a couple of structures in there which have CGen specific stuff in there and target specific stuff. It's not very nice. Sim CPU is a central data structure, and depending on which CPU family you have, it will produce different size versions of that structure. Um, and that's a bit of a, a nasty when it comes to actually trying to do this with multiple CPU families. And we have to uh, provide a definition of sim state, which has some CGen state in it, um, but that's all. So we've put those bits together. You see there's quite a lot of handwritten stuff, albeit you can copy it from someone else's simulator and reuse it um, uh, there. So to configure this, obviously you need to have the simulator specified in the target. And because it's in configure.target, which is in configure in configure.ac, when you do auto reconf, do use the minus F flag to force the change, because it'll look at configure.ac and say nothing's changed. Um, then we have to write a target specific configure.ac, and this has an absolute standard formula, which is this prerequisite in it include a common include file, ac common, ac output, and then target specific stuff. And there's a whole load of macros you can put in there. Um, we're going to say it's a little endian thing. We don't expect alignment. It's got a cache for the simulator of 16K. Its default model is RISC-5-64, and we recognize the CGen maintenance instruction. You don't have to do it by hand. Um, and then we have to write a make file. This is a bit more complicated. It more or less has a standard structure, but you have to write a lot here. You have to tell, define something called sim objects, which are all the objects that make up your simulator. You have to define any extra dependencies, um, which are the CGen generated dependencies and your generated headers. Um, and then, obviously, you're including different fragments in here. Uh, you've got a CGen maintenance um, trigger there. You've got some general dependencies we need for RISC V. And then you're going to say how to make all your binaries from all your source. Now, I know Makefile will automatically do this for you, but you want to pass in the right headers and flags and so forth, um, and have the right dependencies on headers. And there's a load of those for all the binaries you need to create. We then have the, sta the time stamping going on for all the things we need to generate. Okay, so we've got a lot of common dependencies on the CPU and OPC files and so forth, and some of the um, some of the also standard CGen scheme files. And basically, we're going to have this same thing where we have a make target for the architecture files, um, which is um, where we get uh, the arch.h file and the arch.c file and the CPU h file. Those ones are done by make cgen arch. We pass details in. And then we have another one to make the, the, C, the model files and the CPU files. They're make cgen CPU. And they make cgen defs to make the defs header. And make cgen decode to make the decode tables and, and the semantics tables. Um, and lastly, this one's different. It's not by cgen, but there's actually the main loop is generated from an input file um, into the build directory. And you have to write that all by hand. And again, it's look at what someone else has done and copy theirs and modify it as you need. And we've got our own clean file, clean target, which we specify just to clean up um, all those timestamp files. So having made that, you can build your simulator with make all sim. And then you can take your demo program. You can compile it with the existing compiler, or if you didn't have the, because I've got a funny instruction. Um, and then you can. Um, uh, give it to the run function that you've just created, the run command you've just created. We haven't set a memory size, so we better use the memory size to give it some real memory and give it the binary. And this is where I have to make an omission. In preparation for this talk, I did this entire demo system with just one instruction, and the simulator currently hangs. So a revised version of these slides will fix that. I'm not quite sure what I've done wrong. I've done something wrong with the, the handling of the state, so it just hangs, rather than giving me a nice trace of Here's what's happening. And the common way of using the simulator is integrated into GDB. Well, all you need to do with that, 
there's nothing CGen specific here. You just need to tell GDB it's got a LibSim simulator and then build it. And then you can type up GDB and it'll connect to the simulator. Again, you'll need to give it memory size. In a more complex thing, you can set a default memory size if you want to. So you build a simulator that always has you know, 64K of RAM or whatever. So at that way point, I've taken you very quickly through all the steps of making an assembler, disassembler simulator. You can see that when I wrote, when I defined an instruction, it took several lines. And you can see, well, defining all the instructions, I'm going to end up with tens of thousands of lines for a big architecture. So we have preprocessor macros. And these are central to actually making CGen descriptions a reasonable size. And you can define them as function macros that take arguments or just variable macros, very like a C preprocessor in that set, we're saying. So for, fortunately, CGen also gives you some standard things. There's my defined hardware we used before. But I can do that with DNH, define normal hardware with just positional arguments. And then what took me six lines, I can put on a single line. And there's how I'd define the PC if I were doing it with DNH. And there are simplification macros for simple instruction fields, simple in, slightly less simple instruction fields, instruction multi-fields, operands, and instructions. So you find all these things that I was defining on a whole slide can be done on a single line. Um, and to put that in perspective, the entire RISC-V um, description for all the 32-bit and all the 64-bit instructions is about 3,000 lines, um, which, given quite how big that is, is not, is, is not bad. So here's an example of what we've taken from the full RISC-V implementation. We've done a uh, macro to define instructions that are in the RV basic I format, instruction format. And we've got variants of that for particular types of I format instructions, uh, which is RV format. I defined in terms of the previous macro I defined on the previous slide. And then for my instruction, I've got that. So all the binary operator immediate instructions can be done using RV format I hyphen one, because they all have the same format. And that's the way you use macros heavily. There are other things to help. You don't have to do with There's enumerated constants. There's special types of enumerated constants for instruction fields, which stops you using them in the wrong place. And there's define keyword, which is a separate thing for defining all your register names to index mappings um, uh, cleanly. Um, and all of those have simplification macros, so you've, you've got define normal instruction, define normal emung, and so forth. So that was simplifying CGen, complicating CGen. And the thing that drives you mad is, yes, it's all designed so you have multiple families, multiple machines, multiple instruction sets. And it's not that easy. And if anyone asks questions about that, that's why Ed's in the front row. Um, so the assembler disassembler mostly works, but you need a bit more glue in your assembler configuration to say exactly which of the tables you're using. The simulator, that make file becomes vast because you have to, instead of creating CPU.C and CPU.H, you have to do one for each CPU family and ISA. And so you get a huge set of these instructions. And then you need to handwrite headers to glue all the headers together and so forth. And you need a lot more glue to tell the simulator which particular architecture you're simulating today. A lot of it isn't terribly hard. It's too much to go into in this talk. But it's tedious. And one of the things I'd like to see CGen do is to understand this a bit better and actually be able to say, yeah, well, these all look, if you look at people who do this, they all look the same. You ought to be able to machine generate them. So that's it. So let's have a quick summary of the current status. So CGen is quite quiet. Um, there's monthly code snapshots from Frank Eigler at Red Hat. Now, I'd never met Frank. Do anyone here know him? Excellent, good. Um, it'd be nice to hook up in. Um, so he generates um, monthly snapshots. There have been no messages on the mailing list in the second half of this year, not even the monthly snapshots, actually. In the first half of this year, there were 11 messages. Six of them were announcements of monthly snapshots. There was one correspondent who had an issue. And that was three messages, message, reply, thank you. There was one patch um, from Alan Modra to align with the latest bin utils. That was two messages. And there was a message from me announcing the GNU tools cauldron. 
So this is not an active project at the moment. Um, the maintainers are Frank Iger and Doug Evans. I'm not sure, I don't think I've ever met Doug, and I'm not sure how much he's doing on this now. Frank um, uh, regularly uh, produces output. Interestingly, they're listed as maintainers in the binutil repository. There isn't a maintainers file in the CGen repository. One of the problems is that CGen is still in CVS, um, and it's, it's sort of a bit on the side. You need to know about it. And as you can see, what was the first thing I do? Just copy the two key directories into binutils. Um, I know I'd be interested to get feedback from this audience as to whether should it just be moved into bin utils and just become a standard part of bin utils because a lot of bin utils knows all about cgen it just misses the two key cgen directories um uh the wiki is dead because i tried to see if there was any more on the wiki and the link doesn't work um uh, and the documentation needs updating having gone through this talk i've got a load of patches um so you know great project um it's one that's of particular interest to me i hope I'll be able to contribute a bit more over the years. Um, and for a company like Embercosm, it's an important project because we end up doing a lot of different custom architectures and the ability to speed up generation of assemblers, disassemblers, and simulators is invaluable. So having said that, risk five, um, our work on that, we've done CGEM for lots of architectures, but risk five was driven by a customer who wanted to experiment with customized instructions, which is a key thing about risk five. And they wanted to try lots, and they wanted a 24-hour turnaround for giving us a spec of a new instruction and having a tool chain which could dis assemble, disassemble, and simulate that instruction so they could try using them in inline assembler. So that was what was driving us. We have completed just about the assembler and disassembler for RV32GC. So that's the base instruction set, multiply, single precision floating point, double precision floating point, atomic and compressed instruction sets. We've done that for 32 and 64 bit. There are four GCC regression discrepancies. Yes, yeah, um, which hopefully will disappear sometime next week. It's a bit hard for us to submit that and say, here, here's a different way of doing what you already do. Um, we want to demonstrate it by probably adding one more ISA, possibly the draft vector instruction set, so we can say, here is a better way than what we have today, because as the standardization bodies start generating more and more instruction sets, the ability to get those quickly into the tool chain will become critical towards effective acceptance of those. Simulators is a bit refined. The 64-bit IMC uh, instruction sets, they all work, and regression test behavior matches upstream. We're aiming to get all those ISAs in progress, because then the ability to submit and say, you've got every instruction set assembling, disassembling, and simulating is the base at which we want to get to. Um, there's a how-to being published by Embercosm. The idea was I was going to publish that this week and then tell you all about it it's not quite finished. So sometime this month that um, will appear. Um, it was created by Mary Bennett uh, what, during her work with us last year. I've been revising it to uh, sort out a few um, uh, fine details. That will be a comprehensive uh, how-to on how to generate um, CGEM-based uh, assemblers, disassemblers, and simulators. And I hope will become a useful reference for the community as a whole, things that then impact upon the um, user guide, I will then feed back into the upstream user guide. It's not a replacement for the user guide, it's a practical how-to, assuming that you've got the user guide alongside you. Any questions? Lots. So, I wonder, like, uh, how it will compare with something like um, TD file and table gen, like can the description file be generated from one from the other? Sorry, with the echo, I couldn't quite, quite catch that. Uh, <clears throat> my question was like how the description file for CGen will compare with something like um, TD gen files and table gen things? Um. So I think it's how does so the question is how do CGen files com compare with other descriptions of architectures? Like uh, 
writing it is like more difficult or can they be generated from one from the other that sort of thing? In, in principle I mean the obvious one to compare against is LLVM's table gen um, LLVM's table gen does slightly different things but in the same sense of being broadly trying to capture an architecture they are the same um, table gen lacks because it's doesn't need it, any way of capturing semantics, but it does capture the syntax. Um, and you'd think, actually, the whole point of C, CGen is conceived as, hey, you can do lots of things. So one of the things I'm really interested in is actually generating test harnesses. But there should be no reason why you couldn't at least generate the framework of a table gen representation from a CGen description. Clearly, there are bits that table gen has that CGen doesn't. Or vice versa. Sorry? Or vice versa. Or vice versa, yes, you could generate C gen from table gen, yes. Um, who's next? Oh. Um, I think it's, very, it's interesting the perspective of getting C gen integrated in the Vinutils tree. Also, to get rid of the CVS repository, yeah. that would be awesome. But um, I see that in the Vinutils tree, there is a set of architectures which are actually using C gen. Mm -hmm. Or they were, or they used CGen at least once to generate the files under the opcodes. So, if you get the CGen from the CVS and you put it in the binutils, um, what will happen to manual modifications of the already generated files, which are already uh, in binutils? Uh, that is an interesting question. One, the pro one, one, th one problem with CGen is people tend to use it once, and then yeah. people who come afterwards can't. Well, it's quite diff there's a big learning curve. And then people just tweak the tables. There's no immediate problem, because if you don't do enable CGen maint, you're not going to regenerate those things. Um, but it does re represent a bit of challenge. There are some new ones here. The, the open risk stuff is new in the last year or so, because it supports um, Stafford Horn's GCC port. Um, but I agree, yeah, it is a, yeah, it is a problem that, people tend to generate the first tables and then hand tweak because they don't want to learn how to use CGen to change it. Um, I think we have. So at the start of the year, probably, well, maybe the end of last year, I reran um, CGen on all the descriptions that are in bin utils and there's not really that much difference between what gets generated. Um, the, header, the, the copyright dates are obviously wrong in everything because they get manually updated each year. Yeah. Um, but other than that, there were a few differences in some architectures, but most of them are pretty much spot on. Good. Oh, reassuring. Uh, Stefan? Yeah, I was thinking if the person who modifies the generated tables generates them in uh, pretty much the same way that CGen, that, that the rest of the code was written, then CGen could maybe take the tables and generate the modified uh, the description of the uh, CGen thing? Uh, potentially. My experience is people tend to, when they modify the C files, tend to modify bits and not all of it. So it's a bit of a partial thing. But it's, a, it's an idea. So um, I was not previously aware of this stuff. We've been doing a bunch of ISA modeling work for our own purposes in the last few years, building quite substantial models of risk 5 and of the uh, ARM V8A architecture and the second derived from the ARM internal description of that. So we're building at the moment uh, simulators from those and theorem prover definitions from those. Uh, would it be useful, and if so, does someone want to do it, to translate from what we have into CGen in order to make these uh, GNU components? I, I think that would be immensely interesting. I mean, I think, you know, that, that's a good set. Of, there's another thing we can do, which is, it's not a subject for this talk. We have a concept of lockstep debug, which is actually where, under a GDB stub server, you actually have two models running, lockstep instruction by instruction, and it looks to the user like a single target until they diverge, and then you throw an exception, which we use for verifying hardware against models. But potentially, you could run a CGen simulation against your simulation and find all the different ways where they mismatch. Yeah. 
So that'd be another thing. But I, I like the, I, I, you know, the whole point about having formal representation is you can swap them around and you know spot the holes. Yeah. So so we're using um, slightly more modern language design to express the ISA. So there's a more information about the semantics of everything. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. I mean, CGen is a, a product of its time. Um, you know, it, it's a good practical engineering tool, but I'm under no illusions about you know, it, it's not perfect. Any more questions? No. Thank you very much. Um, we're out of time. <laughs>